Thanks, mate. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. How are you? As Mandy said, it's good to see you. Good to brave the wet weather. And um, yeah, my apologies for last week. I wasn't I wasn't able to make it last week. I was a little bit. Um, it was one of my treatment weeks, so I was away. Uh, so I was a little bit crook um, for a few days. But I'm just. Uh, I'm not unashamed to ask for prayer. Prayer is a great thing. I don't think we should ever be. Um, ashamed to ask for people to pray for us. So tomorrow I've got, I've had three months of treatment, um, which finished last week. Uh, tomorrow I go and see my oncologist again. So I've just, for those that are aware of the sort of what's happened over the last three months, um, six weeks ago I had my first CT scan after I started treatment and the, the tumour that was on my pancreas had reduced in size significantly. Um, so I had another CT scan last Friday. So I go back again for another checkup tomorrow. So I'm believing for a miracle. I'm believing for the supernatural intervention of God to continue the healing process. And um, But having said that, I really, really appreciate all your prayers. Um, we need it. I need it. So having said that, so today, it's interesting today, we were, the, some of the songs that we were talking or singing uh, about eternity and um, the song, A Thousand Hallelujahs, that will worship Him or praise Him forevermore. Um, it's an interesting concept, eternity, isn't it? And uh, I just want to have a look at a couple of passages of Scripture today and just really have a look at eternity and really what is it, not so much where is it, but what will it be like. Um, so I just want to start in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. And just read a passage of scripture there to start with. So Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. And he has also set eternity in the human heart. Now it's an interesting scripture because it says that he has set eternity in the human heart. And I was thinking, like the way that God created us, he created us in his image, he created us spirit beings. But I think that he's created us and put something in our heart where the concept of eternity is very real to us. I think most of us, whether we're Christians or not, we would think about eternity and think about what is out there or the fact that there has to be something more than just this. Um, a lot of people searching for it and a lot of people, unfortunately, they, they search in different areas. They, they go and, you know, witchcraft and... And, and all types of meditation and different philosophies and all that sort of stuff to try and, and get an understanding of what eternity is. And I believe that God, as according to the scripture, he places uh, that sense in us that there's more than, than just this. There's more to life than what we experience here and now. Um, and you look at it in the context of that chapter, it talks about that there's a time for everything, for every activity under the heavens. And, and when you go through that list in chapter 3, you know, it says a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, time to kill, time to heal, to tear down, a time to build up, to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. God obviously was thinking of uh, COVID when he said this one, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. When you go through that, that whole list there, it's just a list of it's, it's contrast. And the, and the world that we live in, there's contrast. Every day, pe different people... We experience different emotions, different thoughts. You know, if I was to go through this room, there'd be people in this room now that would be celebrating great things that have happened in their life. They'd be celebrating milestones. They'd have a reason to be, to be happy, to joyful. And in the same uh, time, if I went through, there'd be just as many people here who are probably struggling with something or grieving something or sad about something, you know, or discouragement. So it talks about life, a life full of, of contrast, the ups and downs, that we have, but there is a glimpse of stability in that. 
See, the Bible talks about how Jesus is our anchor and Jesus is our rock. And no matter what you go through, and in that list, the, the, the contrast, no matter where you're at or what, you know, whether you're celebrating today or whether you're a bit down today, it says that He has set eternity. There is something greater for you. There is something out there. There is something that gives us hope. And our hope is in Jesus Christ. And it's not a dead hope. It's a living hope. And the thing is, no matter what we, we, we feel, our feelings and emotions, with, if we've been born again, if we've given our hearts and life to Jesus Christ, we know that there is something waiting for us. And there is also, because of that living hope, it gives us the ability to sustain this life. That hope that we have gives us the ability and the grace and the strength to know that, God, I can get through this because you have, you know, you're with me, you're for me. And there is something greater for me down the track. There is a living hope of eternity. You know, that we will forever be with Him, praising Him and worshipping and, and just to, to experience the fullness of God and creation or whatever that looks like, whatever heaven looks like. I know that it's going to be good. And that's something that can encourage every one of us today, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, man, there is something good waiting for us. There is something great waiting for us. And He has put that in our heart. He has placed eternity in our heart. I remember, I remember when I, was, when I was a kid, about six or seven years old, and it's a really strange thing because you don't often remember many things from... But I remember one day listening to my mum and dad talk in the, in the kitchen and I was around the corner in the lounge room and I was in the, in the hallway and I just had this over, overwhelming uh, sadness or heaviness come on me. I've never forgotten it. And it was in, in relation to eternity. And I was thinking about my mum and dad and I was just thinking about... The, the concept of eternity and what that actually was, the reality that it never ends. <laughs> so it's, it never, ever, ever ends. And I was just thinking about mum and dad and I'm just thinking about would I be with them in that place, wherever it was. And the, 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 the prospect of me not having that actually made me really sad as a six or seven year old kid. Last year I turned uh, 60 and I remember standing up here um, around that time that I turned 60 and just, just saying, you know, like the reality is that three quarters of my life possibly is over. I'm closer to the end than I am to the starting line. And in that, you, you, you start to think a bit more about eternity. Not that it scares you or should scare you and not that it scares me. You know, the Bible says that the sting of death is gone and that's a reality. That's, a, that's, that's real. Um, but you start to think a little bit more about it. And obviously, in the last three months, since I got diagnosed, you probably tend to think about it a little bit more. And as I said, it's not a fearful thing for me, and it's, but it's a curious thing. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking more and more about what's it going to be like? What am I going to be? What am I going to look like in eternity? What's it going to be? Where's it going to be? And I, I just think, we're, look, we're... You can get into the, all the theological debates and all that, but as far as I'm concerned, wherever it is, whatever it is, I know it's going to be great. And I'm not, I know it's going to be awesome. So, uh, yeah, I, I just wrote a little thing here. I just said, to be honest, this, I was just thinking about the understanding of what, what um, it will be like in heaven. I just wrote this little thing down here. It says, to be honest, the idea of me floating around like Casper the Friendly Ghost on white fluffy clouds in a nappy playing a harp doesn't really excite me too much. So when I think of that, like I think eternity's got to be better than that. It's got to be better, better than that. The Bible is an amazing story. It's an amazing book. Um, I, just, I just want to just go back a little bit. Written by at least 40 different authors, written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. It's the story of creation, it's a story of blessing, it's a story of temptation, it's a story of sin. It's a story of salvation, it's a story of redemption or exile and salvation. And when we read the Bible, we, can, we have the advantage of reading it in hindsight because we know, we know the story, we know, you know most of the story, so there's that advantage. But the thing is, it's not over yet. You know, there's lots of things in this Bible, it's the story that's already happened, but there's lots of things that are yet to happen there is an ending 
There's lots still to happen before we get to the very end of this book. And when you look at some of the things, I've just as a, there's a list in no particular order. You know, the, the rapture, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the tribulation. Lots of questions, lots of different opinions in regards to that. Does the church go pre, mid, post, tribulation? Um, do we, we, I don't really want to look at that today, but I just want to say that it doesn't really matter. As long as you're ready to go, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter when it happens. You know, we may pass away before that happens. But the main thing is that we, we're ready when it happens. And in the meantime, we continue to be a witness for Jesus Christ. That's the main thing. So there's a millennial reign of Jesus, a thousand years on earth, Satan's final judgment, the great white throne room, judgment of all unbelievers. And then we come to the end of the end of the end, which we find in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So just thinking about what it's going to look like for us or for me. I'm more thinking about for me. Hopefully that includes a lot of you guys. <laughs> At the very end of the end of the... I hope it includes all of you, actually. The very end of the end of the end, I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 21, just starting from verse 1. So it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from, the, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And behold, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain any more for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true so we look at that that passage of scripture and it's the vision that god gives john and it's a vision of the marriage of heaven and earth it's the bride symbolizing the new creation it's god with us forever and he makes all things new so when you think of i just want to go back we often talk about jesus christ as being the first fruit and when you look at his resurrection um, when he was raised from the dead he was referred to as a first fruit and there's a number of phrases in the Bible that refer to Jesus as the first fruit. So when we think of first fruit, it's like a first instalment. Um, it's the, the, in the, the natural side. It's the beginning of the harvest. It's a sign of things to come. So when we read Revelation chapter 21, it's part of that. The whole concept of, of, of Jesus' death, burial and resurrection is the first fruit. And when we look at that, it's a sign of things to come. So it's a sign of a new heaven, a new earth. It's a sign of the city of God. Um, when we think of Revelation, we often think of Revelation and we approach Revelation. It's a book of, uh, that scares us. It's a book of all these weird symbolisms and symbols, uh, <clears throat> metaphors, lots of metaphors that are things, a way that you can say something to describe something else. So... It's a tricky book, but John is not necessarily writing this <clears throat> book in the way that we may think. He's not writing it to a group of people. He's not writing that. He didn't write Re Revelation for us, believe it or not. We can take and apply principles from it, but he wrote it to a group of people and a group of churches that were suffering severe persecution. Uh, it was first century Rome. Uh, there was an emperor guy called Domitian, the Roman emperor Domitian. And here's a guy, like, he would take away the Christians' homes. He would destroy their homes. He would impale Christians on stakes. And in doing that, he would, like, put pitch and tar on them and use them for, for lampposts. He crucified hundreds and thousands of Christians and placed the crucifix or the, the, placed them along streetways and pathways so bypassers and travellers could see what was going on. Um, John <clears throat> wrote this book and wrote, had this vision to give to a, these churches and to a group of people in Revelation who were being extremely persecuted. And I, you know, I don't want to be cruel, but what you may suffer in the lunchroom at work is not persecution. This is persecution. 
And John, God, John is giving, he's had this vision and he's giving that to a group of people and to the church of, of first century Roman culture. He's giving it them something to encourage them, something to hope for, knowing that, that no matter what they go, went through, no matter what the circumstances and situations, no matter what this, this guy, Domitian, was trying to do or doing to them, that they could overcome. And it's amazing because these guys, these guys were getting thrown into the lions. Lions were having them for lunch and these guys would kneel down and they would sing songs. They would forgive the, the Roman soldiers and forgive the people that were doing and persecuting them and doing all this sort of stuff. Um, the more they, the, the amazing thing, the more that they, they killed them, the more Christianity grew. Because the people, because of the living hope that they had, because of this vision that John had given them to encourage them that there was no matter what they were going through on this planet, there was something greater waiting for them. And that gave them the ability to go through all this sort of stuff to keep their faith. They had a living hope because of the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And whenever we understand about the resurrection, the first fruit, the false in, first instalment, things to come, you know, we look at our own, our own life. <clears throat> it's the first fruit of our salvation. The Bible talks how we're born again, we, 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 we die, we're buried, and we're rose, we, we rise again through the, the power of the, the Holy Spirit. Um, it's about forgiveness of sin. It's about eternal life. Because of Jesus' resurrection, these are the things that give us hope in the life that we live. But the hope that we have enables us to face things that we would struggle with in this world. And I don't know what you're going through today, but man, hang in there. Try and see the big picture because what we're going through here, it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a blimp. It's just a, a drop in the ocean of what we have, the glory that we have, the experiences that we have, the, the eternity, the, the, you know, the, the, eternal home, that place that we're going to spend with God for eternity. But the nature of the hope John's talking about is the end of time as we know it. So John, in this vision, he sees a new creation. He sees a new heaven. He sees a new earth. He sees the holy city coming down out of heaven. This is what John's seeing. I'm reading what John's seeing and there's a lot of different thoughts and things and theologies about what it's going to look like. This is not what Pastor Graham's saying, and I'm not going to get into it too, too deep, but I just want to touch on, on one little thing. What John sees, he sees the holy city and new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Heaven is coming to earth. A new Jerusalem, the holy city of God is coming down. He's creating a new earth and a new heaven, but he has a vision of heaven coming down to earth. And heaven transforming the earth. This is where we're going to spend eternity. A lot of people say that, or some people say that this, this re it's a reference to Genesis chapter 2 with the, the story of creation. That where we spend eternity is going to be the Garden of Eden, paradise restored, maybe a, a, you know, a, a, new, a new earth, a new creation. Uh, a new garden of Eden, because you know you go back to then before the before the fall, we got Adam and Eve. It's a perfect, sinless world, perfect relationship with God, no sin, no consequences of sin, no influence of sin, no sickness, no disease, no weeds in the garden, no pollution. A perfect environment in the presence of God, living, farming, growing food. Imagine the vegetables. Imagine the food. Imagine the produce that's got, that we're going to be eating in heaven. You know, this, is, this is insane. It's incredible. The fall, sin, the influence of sin, the consequences of sin, the corruption. There's corruption, greed, hate, murder, war, famine, poverty, sickness, disease. The new heavens and the new earth is God I don't know, it's resetting, restoring, recreating. And it's going to be a place where there's no longer Sin, the influence, the consequences of sin won't be present, but the beauty of creation, it'll be like the beauty of creation before the fall, whatever that is. The beauty of God's presence. It's going to be a world that we've never, ever experienced. The Bible says that it's going to be something that we can't even think or imagine it's going to be like. I remember since I was 18, I used to, get, used to surf and I'd go down the coast to a place called Bendelong. And to me, that was like heaven on earth. 
especially outside of school holidays. No one down there, beautiful white sandy beaches, beautiful pristine bushland, uh, you know, stingrays. You could feed the, go down there and feed the stingrays. Remy and um, Manoj went down there a little while ago and they, they, they fed the stingrays down there. I remember we went, we used to go, I used to go camping down there when I was younger and do lots of surfing. And then as we grew up and the kids uh, were young, <clears throat> we'd go camping down there and we went camping uh, a couple of times. Did we go once or twice with you guys? Three times. So Vish and Bex and their kids, when they were young, uh, come down and camped with us at different times. But things you remember, I remember one day we were at this little beach and Vish was out there with the a couple of the kids and this, um, all these dolphins come through and Vish thought that it was a pack of sharks. <laughs> so Vish is in the water with the kids and these dolphins are just coming. And they come really close, you know, like they're really friendly. And Vish has had this attack, you know, like it's a panic attack because it's a pack of sharks, though. So. Killer whales, all these killer whales are coming to attack him. <laughs> I remember one day I was in the water down there where the, the stingrays are and um, just up to about waist deep and just amazing. I'm there and I'm just, just you know, just enjoying the, the whole thing. I just felt this big rubbery slimy thing just brush, brush past my legs. It was this massive big stingray, just these cruise around. But, you know, Ben, New Zealand, I've got anyone here from New Zealand, people who've been to New Zealand, absolutely astounding. You know, amazing, incredible scenery, landscapes, lakes, rivers, you know. And yet you get a little taste of that and you think, man, this is just out of this world. It's like heaven on earth. But we look at things like that and we experience things like that and no matter how good that gets or how good the experiences that we can have here on this planet, it's going to be better than you can even imagine, better than you can even think. Tasmania, again, we went down to Tasmania and that's just as nice. It's so beautiful down there. But John is saying that there's something coming that's better. Something that goes beyond our ability to imagine. As I said before, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, For eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart. It's interesting. He sets eternity in our heart in Ecclesiastes. So we have a concept of eternity. But in, the, in here he's saying, we, in our hearts... He's not even entered into our heart, the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Our relationship with God will be perfect. Our environment will be perfect. Yeah, no, no pollution. The rivers, the air. He's going to wipe away every tear. No more mourning, no more pain, no more crying. For the old things have passed away. That's what's coming. That's the hope that we have in Christ. Isaiah 65, uh, 17 to 19, it says, See, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. That's really interesting because I often thought when we get to heaven, when we have an understanding or a concept of maybe loved ones or people, that, friends, that we know weren't saved. But that, that saying, the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. So anything, any, anything that would bring a, a, a tinge of sadness, anything that would bring a tinge of sorrow, you won't even be remembering it. You won't even be thinking it. It will not, it will not even be a, 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 an issue. It's not even on the charts. It's just amazing. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people and a joy. And I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people, the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. So that's, you know, I don't want to, as I said, I don't want to delve into it too much, but when I read that and I read John's vision, he talks about a new, a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. You know, I, I, I think of paradise restored. I think of what it was like before the fall when Adam and Eve were there and, and just that perfect environment in every sense in enjoying the fullness of God. So that, that is, that's my sort of, I'd like to think it was that. I don't know, but that's my, that's where I'm at with it at the moment. What will we be like? What will we look like is another one. I suppose, uh, looking around the room here, there's a lot of us who would like to look a little bit different. <laughs> oh, well, I know if I, I'm going to have hair. I might get my beard back, which would be nice. That's something to look forward to. What will we look like? Again, if we go back to Jesus as being the first fruit 
the death and resurrection as an installment of things to come. It's really interesting. The hope that we have uh, that John talks about is connected to Jesus' resurrection. So Jesus died and he rose again in a resurrected body and he was transformed physically. So what, what did Jesus look like after his resurrection? He had two legs. He had two arms. He was not a ghost. He wasn't floating around on a harp with a harp in his hand. He walked and he talked. He ate and he drank. He had scars on his hands and his feet. He was the same, but there's also a difference. It's his resurrection body. There is a difference. He looked the same, but he could walk through walls. He could appear and reappear. He looked the same, yet he was mistaken by people who knew him. The girls in the garden mistook him for a gardener. The disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't recognise him. So the idea of the same but different is a really unusual concept when we're born again so this is where you know again you, you talk about sim symbolism we take things literally because when we're when we're born again we have experience the bible says what we become what new creations we're different everything's different everything changes but you're the same but new or it talks about the old has passed away john in his vision says that all things are going to pass away. But when we're born again, he says, the old have passed away and all things become new. But we're, So everything's new. The old's gone. We're new, but we're the same. We can still recognise each other. We still have our, our personalities and our characters, all that sort of stuff. The resurrection power of the Holy Spirit transforms us and everything becomes new, but we are the same but different. Our resurrection bodies... What's that going to look like? Are we going to be the same but different? Because Jesus Christ is a first fruit. He looked the same. He was recognisable. He walked, he talked, he ate, he drank. He enjoyed, enjoyed the disciples. He enjoyed company, he enjoyed fellowship. 1 John 3, 2, it says, Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will yet be has not yet been made known. So there is that element of mystery about it. But then he goes on to say, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So that's talking about our resurrection bodies. And it says that we are going to be like him. So to summarise this whole thing, we're going to spend eternity in a place that's a new heaven and a new earth. Everything will be new. It's going to be beautiful. There's going to be mountains, rivers, valleys, paradise restored, the Garden of Eden, whatever it is, it's going to be awesome. It will be a place where God's presence dwells. No matter what your experiences, no matter what encounters you have had on this planet with God, even in a worship service, at DNA, in your own room, no matter what that looks like, and I've had some incredible encounters with God, it's going to, be, it's going to just pale into insignificance and being in his presence and encountering him and being with him. It will be better. As good as what we have here and now, it will be better. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, For now we see only as a reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see, we, then we shall face to face. Now I know in part that I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So in eternity, we're going to experience God's presence fully. That is the living hope. This is a living hope that we have. It was given to John for the early Christians in those times of persecution, but we, it was also given for us in the times of persecution, the times of sickness, the time of illness, the times of struggle. It's given to us because it's a living hope. That's our future. Your job's not your future. You know, your marriage and your relationships, as good as that is, that's not your future. It is here. But no matter what we go through, no matter what we struggle, our future is going to be glorious. It's given to us to help deal with the troubles of life. We have a hope, we have a future, no matter what the present tells you, our future is glorious. No matter what the present says to you today, look at it 
through the lens of eternity. I just want to read a quote uh, before I finish. This is from a guy called Tim Keller. Um, and interesting, Tim Keller is actually going through the same thing I'm going through at the moment. But this is, uh, this is his spin on what we will look like or for, for us. It says, our future is not an immaterial one. We are not going to float around in the kingdom of God like ghosts. We're going to walk. We're going to eat. We're going to hug and be hugged. We're going to love. We're going to sing because we will have vocal cords. We will do all of this in degrees of excellence, satisfaction, beauty and power. We cannot imagine. We will eat and drink with the Son of Man. And he says, this is not merely a consolation in heaven for the material life that we lose here. This is a restoration of that life. That excites me. When I stand here today and I think of what eternity is going to be like, floating around in a nappy with a harp on, on fluffy white clouds doesn't do too much for me. When I think of eternity on a recreated, restored earth, the Garden of Eden, where everything is just yeah, perfect. No tears, no sadness, beautiful mountains. If you enjoy bushwalking, they're going to be the best bush, walk, bush you've ever seen. If you enjoy climbing mountains, if you enjoy fishing, well, it says there's, there's not going to be any sea, so that might be an issue. <laughs> It's got to be the river of life. That's right. It's the river of life. See, that excitement, and to, to know my, my mum's passed away, to know I'm going to see my mum, to know I'm going to recognise her, she's going to recognise me, to know all you guys, that when we get to eternity, we're going to know each other. It's not like we're going to be floating around and zooming in and out of walls and like, Ooh. we're going to be able to talk, we're going to be able to hug, we're going to be able to sing together, we're going to be able to sit down and have a meal together. But there will be no sickness no disease, no illness. Everything is going to be perfect. Whatever our present tells us, we must live in light of eternity. The new heavens and the new earth is the culmination of the biblical story. God accomplishes his original purpose for creation. The curse of Adam is reversed and he provides us with a place to dwell with him for eternity that excites me that ticks my box I remember saying a couple of weeks ago that there was a part when I when I first got diagnosed I had this really really uh, weird moment where I actually got excited about seeing Jesus about going home and it was quite nice actually the sting of death's gone guys when you give your heart to Christ when you surrender your life to him Death doesn't have a sting on you anymore. You know, if you go down to verse 6 in, in Revelation chapter 21 that I just read, it talks about that if you thirst, I'll just read it so I'll make sure I get it right. Revelation 21 verse 6. He said to me, it's done. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the, at the end. To the thirsty, you're thirsty today? To the thirsty, I give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Water without cost, freely, from the spring of the water of life. So what does that look like? You go back to John chapter 4 and there's a story about a Samaritan woman that Jesus meets at a well. And he says to her, he says, the water that I can give you, if you drink from this water, you'll never thirst again. It's something that Jesus wants to give us that will satisfy every one of your needs, every one of your desires. Totally satisfy you. 
You know, when Jesus was on the cross, he turned around when God rejected him. He said, why have you forsaken me? But just before that, he said, I'm thirsty. And that's a really interesting concept because when you think of Jesus being our substitute, and you think about this woman, the Samaritan woman, she says, give me, that, give me that drink, give me that water that I'll never thirst again. And Jesus took our place and he said he was thirsty. He took everything, our sin, he took our thirst. He took our desire to be loved. He took our desire to be needed. He took our desire to be accepted. He took our shame. He took our guilt. He took our pain. The perfect substitute. And you look around the world today and it's the people that thirst, the people that, you know, they, they need, the, 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 the sin rules their life and, they, and, and they're just thirsty and they keep, you know. Jesus is the one who can satisfy you. He is the one that can give you the water of life that you'll never, ever need to drink again. He's talking about salvation and everything that that represents. In light of eternity, where, where do you stand this morning? In light of eternity, can you have that, con that, full, you have that full assurance in your heart that, yeah, man, that excites me. Death doesn't scare me. It's just a doorway. It's just a doorway into something more glorious, something greater, something that we can't, our minds can't even get around something that we've never seen. It's going to be a place where we live and enjoy creation, enjoy the presence of God, enjoy each other and enjoy food. You know, we're going to be eating, we're going to be drinking, we're going to be sleeping maybe, I don't know. I don't know, some of I enjoy sleep, an afternoon sleep, so I can't see why that can't be part of heaven. <laughs> but whatever it looks like, you need to know in your heart that when the time comes, whether Jesus comes back or whether we, whether we pass away, that you're ready. And that's just accepting him, asking him to forgive you, asking him to wash you with the blood of Jesus Christ, to cleanse you of all your unrighteousness. He removes your past and he gives you a glorious, glorious future. That's an invitation. Our job is to accept it. We don't have to do anything except accept it. An invitation. An invitation to live here and now with peace, comfort, in relationship with Jesus Christ and an invitation to experience the fullness of everything good that He has planned for us. So if you're not sure where you stand, if you're not sure about that, you need to know in your own heart and your own life. And that is between you and God, not me and you. So if that's you and you need to talk after the service, I'm happy to have a conversation with you and, and discuss those things with you. If that's not you, see you in heaven, guys. <laughs> I'm not going to, not yet, not yet, not yet, no. So, yeah, so let's stand up. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful saviour we have. What a wonderful, you know, it's just, isn't it funny? We all, we're all different. We all enjoy different foods and different hobbies and different things. But every one of us, you're going to be totally satisfied in heaven. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the reality of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. God, today we stand here, Lord, and we'll all we just say thank you, thank you, thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for the reality of our salvation, God. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the living hope because of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you, Lord, for the living hope that we have in you. God, the future that you have, the plans and the purposes that you have for us, God. Lord, not only here, God, Lord, but Lord, in eternity. God, to be able to fellowship, to be able to enjoy each other's company, to be able to be there and enjoy your presence fully, God. Lord, to walk and talk and, and eat and just enjoy eternity, enjoy creation, God. Lord, God, we just thank You so much for that reality. So God, today we honour You and we bless You. But God, I pray, Lord, that until that time, Father, Lord, You give us the strength and You give us the boldness and You give us, Lord, the grace and the ability, God, Lord, to be a witness for You on this planet because there's souls out there, Lord, that are going to a lost eternity. 
And your desire is that no one should perish. So, Father, I pray that you put that in our hearts. You set eternity in our hearts, God, Lord. But I pray today, God, that you will set a burden in each one of our hearts, God, Lord, for the lost. God, for those that don't know you, Lord, for the ones that need you and need your salvation, I pray, God, Lord, that you'll put that burden in our hearts, God, Lord, that we will be desperate and passionate about being the salt and the light and being a witness for you. So, Father, today as we go, I pray you bless your people. I pray you bless the word, God, that's gone out. You say that it won't, that it will accomplish everything, Lord, that you purpose and will not return to you void. Father, I pray that your word will just ignite and initiate and activate something in our hearts and in our lives today, God, for your glory and for your honour. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Stay dry. Have a great afternoon. Have a great week. And uh, we'll see you next week.